Gentlemen viewers and gentlemen viewers, good evening, and welcome to this new episode of Historical Sketches, the 73rd of the series, and the second dedicated to Dante Alighieri, whose 700th anniversary occurs this year, and who lived from 1265 to 1321. As mentioned in the previous episode, dedicated to Dante, and with many qualifications and reservations, Dante can be considered the Shakespeare of Italy, insofar, insofar as the shaping of the Italian language as spoken, or perhaps misspoken today, can be sourced to Dante Alighieri. I ended, I ended the previous episode dedicated to Dante, referring to his poetical style of which he is considered the father, a style called the Dolce Stil Nuovo, sweet new style, whose definition could be condensed into a, a romantic style in which the object of, love, of the poet's love is shrouded in an ethereal veil of spiritual rather than material love. A point, a point that enabled the poet to dedicate passionate verses to the object of his love without incurring the suspicion of further motives. In this episode, I will examine some of the main events in Dante's life, notably his being banned from Florence, sent into exile, roaming in northern Italy, his presence in Paris, being patronized by various feudal lords, and eventually ending up in Ravenna, where he died and where a monument was erected to commemorate him. Dante lived about 300 years before Shakespeare, and, from the biographical sources available, Dante's life was more troubled than Shakespeare's, at least from the political point of view. For Shakespeare was a playwright and an actor, and, after achieving his success on the, London's, on the London stage, at least according to the records available, we could say that Shakespeare led the equivalent life of a Hollywood producer, and he lived in an England that, as a nation, was already established and therefore at least politically more stable. Though a few decades, decades later, in the 1640, 1640s, England herself would sink into a civil war, the Cromwell dictatorship, the decapitation of Charles I, and so on. Though Shakespeare, too, clearly had strong feelings about the vicissitudes and the fleetingness of life, as shown in many, in many of his verses and sonnets. For example, when we are born, we cry that we are coming to this great stage of fools. Or, another example, what is pomp, rule, reign, but earth and dust, and live it as we may, yet die we must, and so on. Dante, instead, lived 600 years before Italy became a nation, and at a time when the medieval era was mutating into the age of the city-states, cities often at war against each other, as we will see. As a background to this phrase, disputes, battles, and spilled blood, there were two overarching powers, the empire, that still held a nominal authority over both the remaining and still strictly feudal domains of Germany and Italy, and on the other side, the city-states. Whereas the papacy, thanks to its spiritual and temporal power, attempted and often succeeded, often succeeded in curtailing the power and the jurisdiction of the empire. The weapons of the papacy were excommunication and wars, wars waged against unruly city-states and, by proxies, against the empire. Much as today the United States employs contractors to conduct wars overseas, the excommunication was the equivalent of the economic sanctions applied by the USA against nations that do not recognize America's exceptionality. Today, the notion that a papal excommunication 
could create a peril to an entire nation appears, appears amusing, but not during Dante's time. When we consider that the majority of the people, including the wealthy, irrespective of the type of conduct they may have led in their lives, were extremely, extremely concerned about the afterlife. Nevertheless, this had some beneficial consequences for posterity. Wealthy merchants and oligarchs of the new Renaissance age, on point of death, left substantial funds to build churches, maintain or extend cathedrals, plus, of course, endowments for various charities and hospitals and ample funds for masses to be celebrated so as to reduce the length, to reduce the length of their respective possible residences in purgatory, assuming, of course, that their generous, their generous contributions would ensure their salvation from hell. Culturally and historically, this is important. As we know, the three sections of Dante's Divine Comedies are dedicated to hell, meaning inferno, purgatory and paradise. Dante's selection of who ends up where gives us, gives us a good and interesting historical insight about Dante's political and sociological views of society and on what was the, the spirit of Dante's times. Important sources of information uh, for Dante's life derived from writers with different political views. One of these was Giovanni Villani, who produced a comprehensive history of Florence, a history that begins from the time of the Romans, to demonstrate, to demonstrate the nobility of Florence given her direct connections, connections with the glories of Rome. Villani was a wealthy merchant enrolled, therefore, into the Arte, the guild, the guild of the merchants. With great liberty of interpretation, Villani belonged to the party opposed to the political views of Dante. And it is difficult to compare the main political ideas of the time with those of today. Though, to be fair, even today it is difficult, any longer, I think, to distinguish, for example, who is a leftist and who is a rightist. According to, or maybe thanks to Giovanni Villani, the majority of posterity has gained the impression that Dante's character was surly, harsh and unbending. And because of this interpretation, people, or I should say Italian students at least, see the usually following representation of Dante, whereas Dante's portrait by Giotto, was, who, who, Giotto, who was his contemporary, shows a somewhat milder expression, at least I think so. Another source of information about the life of Dante is Dino Compagni, who also wrote the chronicles of his times. Dino Compagni was a fellow member of the same party as Dante's, and in the previous Dante's episode I reached, I reached the point when the original dispute among Guelphs, meaning the party of the Pope, and the Ghibellines, meaning the party of the Emperor, had evolved, had evolved, or perhaps distilled, had distilled into a feud between the white Guelphs and the black Guelphs. Here the colors were used purely for classification. The leader of the whites was a gentleman called Vieri dei Cerchi, and the leader of the blacks was Corso Donati. Vieri dei Cerchis was head of a family that, in broad terms, were what the French called the Nouveau Riche, the recent capitalists. The blacks and their leader, Corso Donati, belonged instead to a dynasty originally Ghibelline, meaning pro-emperor, but had turned Guelph after a political assassination that I will not go into because there were, there are too, just too many political assassinations in Dante's times. The Florentines have a historic tradition of adding, adding colorful nicknames to people, and the name they gave to the family of Corso Donati was I Malefami, translatable as the up to no good, which should tell us something both about the historical and the psychological point 
of view of the times of Dante, of Corso Donati as well. However it may be, Corso Donati was skillful and able to disguise his goals of dictatorship. Poets dedicated poems to him and the famous doctor of his time, Dr. Alderotti, dedicated to Corso Donati his treatise, in Latin of course, titled De Conservanda Sanitate, that is, how to conserve your health, a topic, I should say, as relevant then as today, especially during this current age of epidemics, doubtful remedies, doubtful medicines and doubtful vaccines. Corso had fought in the Battle of Campaldino in 1289, a battle to which also Dante participated. War was the essential and existential background of 13th and 14th century Florence, and not only Florence. Let us remember for reference that the 100-year war between France and England began while Dante was on this earth. I will only mention this one battle of Campaldino due to Dante's participation. It took place in the plain of Campaldino, in the vicinity of the town of Poppi, in the plain below the castle belonging to the Guidis family. It was a battle between the Guelphs of Florence and the Ghibellines of Arezzo, where a mixed band of pro-papal Guelph forces and allies from Pistoia, Lucca, Siena and the Prato were all commanded by a French mercenary force, today we would call them contractors, namely Amerigo of Narbonne and his professional soldiers. The adversary was a Ghibelline force from Arezzo, including the perhaps reluctant bishop Guglielmino degli Ubertini, Dante Alighieri, while Dante Alighieri was 24, 24 years old at the time of the battle. According to Giovanni Villani's chronicle, the occasion for this war were conventional outrages on the part of Arezzo, but the immediate cause were reports, reports that the Guelphs were ravaging the places of Conte Guido Novello, who was Podesta of Arezzo, and worse, they were threatening a castle called Bibiena Civitella. This led to an Aretine force being quickly assembled and marching out to counter the threat. Villani also reports that a treasonous plot had been intercepted at Arezzo involving the Bishop of Arezzo himself, who had agreed to give over to the Florentines lands and castles in return for a life annuity of 5,000 golden florins guaranteed by the, banks, by the bank of the Cherkis family. But these are details. Florence won. Now let's get back to the blacks and whites, or rather to Vieri dei Cerchi, white, and Corso Donati, black. The Cerchi family came from humbler origins than the Donatis, though they were quickly successful, notably in banking and in organizing what we would call today strategic marriages. However, in the never-ending dispute between the Pope and the Empire, and given Pope Boniface VIII's intention to make Florence subservient to him, Boniface VIII sided with Corso Donati. In town, Florence I mean, Corso Donati was ever looking for occasions for brawls, and citizens fled when the two bands of the opposing parties met. The dispute turned violent on the night of the Feast of May, that in Florentine language is called Calendi Maggio, meaning the 1st of May, when a group of rioters belonging to the party of the Blacks of Donati cut the nose of Ricoverino dei Cerchi, a member of the Cerchi family. Eventually Corso overstepped his bounds and had to flee Florence. But the Pope chose him to be the Podesta, the Podesta, which means mayor, but in medieval times it meant a stronger position than today's traditional mayors of cities. Henceforth, Corso became the Podesta of the city of Orvieto, 
a magnificent town that has retained its notably medieval structure, including the beautiful, the beautiful cathedral. In fact, Pope Boniface VIII had a cunning plan in mind, namely to use the offices or services of the army of Charles Valois, brother of the King of France, in principle, in principle to bring peace, or if you like, freedom and democracy to Florence, in practice to bring Florence under papal control. By the way, Boniface VIII succeeded the only pope who resigned while in office. Celestine V, before the recent resignation of Benedict the Sixteenth. According to the story, according to the story, Boniface VIII had set up a rudimentary loudspeaker, pretending to broadcast the voice of an angel, who during the night repeated to Celestine these words: "I am the angel sent by God to order you to promptly renounce the papacy and return." To being a friar. In fact, Charles of Valois, along with his troops, reached eventually Florence. The rulers and administrators of Florence, called priori, a word meaning men of particular dignities, were forced to admit Charles of Valois into the city, whereupon Charles promptly allowed the forces of Corso Donati to enter the city and Corso was eager for blood and revenge. It was a total surprise. Charles, who came to establish peace, unleashed a bloody one-sided war simply because the whites were not prepared. Charles had convened the heads of the blacks and whites, pretending to broker a peace, but he detained the whites while releasing the blacks. The priori the leaders then in charge have had just the time to resign and leave the city, substituted by other priores belonging to the Black Party. Now, it just so happens that, prior to this development, the government of the priores of Florence had dispatched had dispatched Dante to Rome for meeting to have a meeting with Boniface VIII, and to plead with the Pope about maintaining the independence of the government of Florence. But Florence was too good a morsel for the Pope to give it up, and Dante's embassy was unsuccessful, not only. But in the meantime, the success of the blacks, led by Corso Donati and facilitated by Charles Valois, meant that Dante was no longer a representative of a government that has ceased to exist. Prudently, Dante did not return to Florence, because his position had become personally critical. He was condemned to death for not having appeared twice in front, in front of the tribunal, now in the hands of the blacks of Corso Donati. But if he, Dante, had showed up, it is likely that Italy would not have had the Divine Comedy. The, in fact, the insurrectional tribunal produced 698 condemnations of which 559 to death. The next pope after Boniface, which was who was Benedict XI, tried to establish peace in Florence with some success. But there were subsequent wars between the whites and the blacks, in which wars, incidentally, there appears for the first time on the stage of history the name of the Medicis, the famous Medicis, who were fighting on the side of the blacks. Incidentally, incidentally, after the blacks removed the whites from Florence, including Dante, they divided themselves into black factions, one of Corso Donati and the other of Rosso della Tosa. Paraphrasing Shakespeare, the course of Florence political life never ran smooth. Eventually, Corso Donati outdid himself. In 1308, he tried to take power as lord of the city with the aid of his father-in-law, and was condemned as a rebel and a traitor. He died on October, on October 6, 1308, while attempting to flee, to, to flee the city after having been besieged in his house by the, an angry mob as depicted in this miniature. At the beginning of his exile, Dante still attempted, along with some leaders of the white faction, to retake Florence. 
and they decided initially to enroll the services of a ruler, a ruler of the city of Forlì in the region of Romagna. His name was Scarpetta degli Odelaffi, or Ordelaffi rather, and Dante had the task of traveling to Forlì and negotiate with Scarpetta. In doing so, he stayed at the monastery of the mountainous San Benedetto in Alpe, and traveling along the valley of Montone, as it is called, he saw the falls of Aquaceta, that were the model, the model for his description of the infernal river called Flegetonte. Today, the falls can be reached by a 30-minute walk from the town of San Godenzo, where the exile whites had held, held the meeting deciding on what to do after Florence, Florence occupation by the blacks. In 1303, the whites, with the help of Scarpetta from Forlì, assembled a force of 6,000 infantrymen, and among them was the brother of one of the famous characters depicted in the Divine Comedy, Francesca da Rimini, of whom, perhaps, Francesca's brother told Dante the sad story of Francesca and her lover Paolo, both having been killed by Francesca's husband and both found in Dante's hell. A love story with some similarity to that of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Paolo and Francesca, Paolo and Francesca were reading a book about the medieval hero Lancelot and his lover Genevieve when they reached the part where Lancelot was kissing his lover. At that point, Paolo did the same with Francesca, and therefore Dante has Francesca saying that the guilt of everything that passed on next was really the book. The guilty was the book. In Italian, Galeotto fu il libro e chi lo scrisse. Quel giorno più non vi leggemmo avante. Which, in translations in English, of the Divine Comedy, made in 1904, goes... The book and the writer both were love's purveyors. In its leaves that day we read no more. Now, from the story back to history. After some initial success, Scarpetta's army was defeated. Dante managed to escape, but many of the whites, however, were captured by Corso Donati's men and brought back to Florence. They were made made to dress as paupers, paraded on the streets on donkeys, then they were decapitated, decapitated, 368 of them. Now, Dante travelled north, reaching first the illustrious city of Verona, incidentally famous for having been the setting of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Historically, Verona between the two sides, Pope and Emperor, had sided mostly with the Emperor. And it was one of the first cities to transform itself or herself from a city-state, whose formation I touched on the previous episode, to, to transform herself into what is called the Signoria, meaning a city governed by the Signori, the lords belonging specifically to one family and to one family only just like Florence became also a signoria under the lordship of the Medici family. From a signoria, eventually Florence evolved into a grand dukedom, which only meant the confirmation that the head of the city-state and of the rest of Tuscany was a hereditary person, where the ruler, instead of being a king, was a duke. There followed, there followed various intermarriages of the Florentine rulers with other European Euro European ruling families, and the last Medici duke was called Gian Gastone de' Medici, who lived from 1671 to 1737. Back to Dante. After Verona, Dante moved to the nearby city of Padova. Padova had had friendly relations with Florence, with which Florence it had ex often exchanged mayors or podesta. The idea being that a podesta an authority belonging to a different region or of a different foreign city was a guarantee, some kind of guarantee for neutrality among the internal warring factions, as we have seen. In Padova, Dante found, perhaps, perhaps, a home away from home. It had become the seat of an important and famous university 
following the escape of many academics from Bologna, where the blacks of Bologna, meaning partisans of the Pope, had won over the whites, meaning partisans of the Emperor, and the whites had left. Padova had converted from a city-state into a signoria as well, and the ruling family were the Scrovegni, they were called the Scrovegnis, one of whom, Enrico Scrovegni, had decided, had decided to build the church dedicated to the Madonna. To decorate the church, Scrovegni called in Giotto, and Dante was in Padova when the famous Cappella degli Scrovegni was inaugurated the 5th, 25th of March of 1306. The amazement and the admiration of the Paduans was so strong that the date of the inauguration was made a festivity for the next 300 years. Dante also found hospitality in the regions of Lunigiana at the service of one of the famous ancient families, the Malaspinas, who have left sundry castles and artistic relics of the Middle Ages in good part of the Northwest Apennines. Dante was employed by various rulers either in diplomatic or clerical tasks, and all this was good for literature. How else, how else, if not for direct contact with qualified sources, could he have found the stories of so many characters as we find in the Divine Comedy? Dante also visited France and Paris, where, in 1257, Robert de Sorbonne, chaplain of Louis IX, founded Robert de Sorbonne founded the University of Paris, today referred to as the Sorbonne. The French liked and liked Dante and dedicated to him a statue close to the university. Dante mentions several French places in the comedy, and perhaps the delta of the river Rhone on the Mediterranean inspired him to describe the topography of hell. He decided to end his days, his days on earth in Ravenna a quiet city filled with the memories of her glorious past as capital of the Italian part of the Byzantine Empire, whose Byzantine legacy is still extant today in the beautiful mosaics of its churches. Dante was accompanied to Ravenna by his two sons and by his daughter Beatrice, or Beatrice, who ran the household and who eventually became a nun. Here, as he was writing the Paradise, he found a valuable consultant in the Archbishop of Ravenna called Rainaldo. Dante died in Ravenna in 1321, and soon after, soon after, the legate of the church in Lombardy said that Dante's remains should be destroyed for he was for him having been a heretic. But it was Pietro Bembo, a cardinal, a writer a poet and a humanist to extract the memory of Dante from the untouchables of the church, so to speak. And in 1778 a chapel was built in Ravenna to hold Dante's remains. I will end with a personal note. My great-great-grandfather, a Piedmontese, who was, work was working in the railways in the second part of the 19th century. He did not go to school, but was self-instructed and taught himself literature, and called his two sons, respectively, Dante and Virgil, Virgil being the Latin poet who, with Dante, is one of the main protagonists of the comedy. And, and, one of my two sons has also Dante as his name. Thank you for watching, and until next time, may all the number of the stars give light to your fair way. Good night.